Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to CIBC. I'm so glad uh, to be here, and I'm so glad to see everyone else here as well. Um, I went to a uh, Christian conference yesterday with uh, just a few people here at CI, and there was a, a passage that was shared from one of the speakers that, that was just really awesome. Um, it, it's amazing what's in the Bible. I mean, I just don't know stuff like this exists. But let me share this with you. Um, this was the speaker's uh, favorite passage. And, and as I'm meditating and reading it over and over again, um, I, I can understand why. It, it, it describes and paints a picture of, of who God is. Who is this God that we come before um, day after day, week after week, moment by moment? Um, and, and often we, we take for granted and don't see really who God is. So a passage like this helps us. So um, in Job 26, uh, verses 7 to 14, it says, God stretches the northern sky over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. He wraps the rain in his thick clouds, and the clouds don't burst with the weight. He covers the face of the moon, shrouding it with his clouds. He created the horizon when he separated the waters. He set the boundary between day and night. The foundations of earth tremble. They shudder at his rebuke. By his great power, the sea grew calm. By his skill, he crushed the great sea monster. His spirit made the heavens beautiful, and his power pierced the gliding serpent. That, that is just awesome, just what, um, what God, our God can do. But there's more. There's one more verse at the end. It says, these all the things that we just talked about, these are just the beginning of all that he does, merely a whisper of his power. Who then can comprehend the thunder of his power? Wow. The, these are just a whisper. This is just a sample of, of, of a little bit of what we can see and know about God. And if he were to display all his power, None of us would be able to even comprehend it. And that is the same God we worship today. So let's uh, start off with this first song. Uh, please stand as we uh, worship together. We're here. 
us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your hearts, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your hearts, filling every part of our praise. insignificant people like ourselves 
Father, as we come before you to give an offering, Father, we pray, Lord, that we would, that you would receive this. Father, please bless the gift as well as the giver. And Father, we continue on to stand in all of who you are. In Jesus' name. You are beautiful beyond description, do marvelous for words, do wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard, who can grasp your who can fathom the depths of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty in throne above. And I stand, I stand in all of you. I stand. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday worship here at CIBC. Uh, at this time, I would like to uh, dismiss our children to Children's Church. Thank you for staying with us, and we hope you have a great time worshiping God as, as well. Um, yeah, uh, we have a, a number of uh, big announcements, but we will get to those after our, um, our time of worship and before we're dismissed. So uh, for now, would you just uh, join me as I open our time together in a word of prayer? We have a, a lot to lift up before the Lord. Let's, let's pray. Father God, Lord, as we 
just uh, have seen the news uh, around the world and even within our own nation. But we know that uh, there is turmoil in our world. And Lord, as the, the songs we just sang so wonderfully reminds us, Lord, that you are still sovereign over all, whether it is over nature, Lord, uh, and, and everything that it brings with its beauty and its ferocity, whether it is in the rising and falling of kingdoms and nations and the, uh, the, the reign of leaders, Lord, you are sovereign over it all. And there is nothing that escapes your plan, and there's nothing that escapes your oversight. And Lord, we are grateful for that. It is in times like these where there is uncertainty, it seems, in every part of our lives, Lord, that we need to be reminded that you are in control, Lord, that all of this, all the goings-on on earth is as nothing to you. It is the very tip of your power. And there is so much more going on in your plan than we can possibly understand. So, Lord, as we are reminded of your sovereignty, may we now also turn to your word, your letter, your communication to us to reassure us, to encourage us, to embolden us, and to equip us for these times, Lord, so that we can go forth and be your servants and your representatives to bring hope and peace to those who have none. So, Lord, it is with expectation that we come before you and we come before your word. May you prepare our hearts. Lord, may you speak to us. May you challenge us. May you transform us. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we will be concluding our study in the book of Daniels. We were, we've been going through the book of Daniel, and uh, we've been, we're, we'll, be, we'll be wrapping up our study with a look at the sixth chapter. We're not going through the whole book, but we're really focusing on the narrative portion of Daniel's experience in uh, Babylon, and today we will see his experience in the, the kingdom of Persia. And there's a reason for that, and the reason is because we need to be reminded of examples like Daniel, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in this time not just in what's going on in our country, but as we've been reminded so vividly also what is going on in our world. We've looked at the way that Daniel and his friends have reacted to a variety of different situations as they seek to live out their faith in a hostile and pagan world, much more hostile and pagan than we can even imagine. Basically growing up as slaves in the kingdom that conquered uh, the, the kingdom of Judah. Uh, they've seen their people slaughtered, carried off into slavery, and they've been forced to serve under these wicked pagan kings. And today, as we come to the uh, final chapter in our study, Daniel chapter 6, we see perhaps one of the clearest instances where Daniel has a target painted on his back. He is the target. He is the one that the pagans are aiming their, their schemes and their, their malevolent intent at. He is under attack. The pagans are attacking. And for many of us, this may feel like what we are going through in America right now. Um, in this age of social media, where there are pundits and there are talking heads that we can turn to, um, a lot of conservative or Christian analysts will, will, will take a look at America and say, yes, we are under attack. The pagans are attacking. I thought it would be good then for us to kind of maybe get a big picture and to maybe keep in mind, what does it actually look like when, quote unquote, the pagans attack? And it's really about the attacks of Satan. Right? At the heart of it, when we talk about this pagan world, attacking or persecuting Christians. We're talking about the, 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 the mind behind it. That is Satan. Satan attacks. Satan is on the prowl as a roaring lion. Scripture tells us he's the one who, are sling, who is slinging uh, fiery darts our way, and he often does that through persecution. 
But also, having grown up in America, I, I also noticed a trend, however, that perhaps sometimes we are very quick to, to point to certain things as, oh, well, that's Satan attacking right there. That's got to be Satan attacking. We, we tend to be uh, perhaps not hypervigilant. We tend to look for attacks all over the place. Here are some of the things that I grew up with and maybe you grew up with. Uh, number one, I grew up in the 80s, and uh, during that time, I just remember that, you know, this thing called Dungeons and Dragons. I, I heard about it in youth group, and that was the great evil that was facing the, the kids at the time, where this game, it's about magic and witchcraft. If you get into it, it can lead you towards Satanism. Um, thankfully, that wasn't the case for me, but I, I remember growing up in the 80s, along with Dungeons and Dragons, there were things like heavy metal music. You know, that was the gateway to satanic influence. I even heard things as I was growing up, like the Cabbage Patch Kids uh, being secretly influenced by uh, pagan uh, deities, and, and if you have one in your home, you know, it could be a source of, of evil and corruption. Um, going into the 90s, uh, definitely as kids got into Pokemon, I've heard my fair share of warnings about Pokemon, and you got to be careful. There are spiritual influences from the Pokemon cards. Uh, a little later, it was Harry Potter. Um, I've heard, I remember hearing stories about people holding book-burning parties where they would burn Harry Potter books and how Harry Potter is the new, uh, you know, front of the attack. As we moved into perhaps the 2010s, who knew that Starbucks Christmas cups would become a point of battle. Satan is a wily one, right? Uh, I just remember kind of scratching my head, you know, thinking, well, why are we so fired up about the fact that Starbucks, uh, I guess, they removed certain holiday imagery from their cups for one year. I believe it was like 2016 or 2015, and people got in, up in arms about that. They, they saw it as a war on Christmas and a war against Christ. And uh, I think ever since then, Starbucks, we always kind of keep an eye on, oh, what are they going to do uh, during the holidays with their cups? And they've done a variety of different things. But most recently, it appears that the battleground has been over, uh, for some people at least, in, in the Christian community, over the issue of masks. And I am, I got to say, I'm glad that most of you, or pretty much all of you, are wearing masks. I'm glad for that. But I find it strange that you know, a face mask that we put on to protect ourselves and one another from viruses and, and a variety of other things has turned into this symbol of either oppression or, uh, you know, caving in to the world. And some people see a spiritual element of that as well. What I find funny, especially about this, is, you know, as I uh, talk with Pastor friends and associates uh, around the nation, how you view masks really depends on what area you're in. I, I, in fact, recently I heard from a pastor friend of mine that what he was going through with his church in the Midwest was uh, they were kind of accusing the leadership of conforming to the world by being too lax on their uh, uh, COVID restrictions. So in, in essence, they're saying because you allow people to not wear masks or you have a looser uh, restriction, you are caving in to the world because in the Midwest, generally speaking, that is uh, the, the atmosphere. People are more relaxed about the restrictions. So if you're a Christian in the Midwest, the act of uh, not wearing a mask would be seen as you're conforming to the world. Whereas uh, here in the, in the West Coast, where perhaps conservatives feel that they're more under attack. If you wear a mask, you will be seen as, oh, well, you're just caving into the world. So it's kind of interesting that this issue, it really depends on the area you're in. But what happened this week as we looked at the news in what happened this week in Afghanistan, I think it helps us to put things into perspective, doesn't it? You may be familiar with some of these pictures of refugees waiting for salvation at the airport, waiting for a plane, cramming into planes, and even more horrifically, even falling out of planes in their bid to escape the Taliban. And one image that was seared into my mind is this image of, of a, a mother handing her baby to the U.S. forces, handing 
uh, I don't even know the gender of the baby, him or her over the fence to the stranger so that they could get out. When we see images like this and we hear about what is actually happening in the world, it puts persecution into perspective. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't, I'm not saying that Satan doesn't influence us in covert ways. He does. Okay, we understand as Christians that until Christ returns, Satan is basically in charge of this world, obviously under God's oversight. But he has free reign in this world. He will use all manners and measures at his disposal to attack Christians, to prevent people from coming to faith. It happens. Satan attacks both, both covertly and overtly. But images like this help us put true persecution into perspective. And it helps us, especially this week as we look at Daniel chapter 6, really understand what Daniel was facing. You see, by this time, scenes like this in Afghanistan, Daniel has seen this at least twice. First, during the fall of Jerusalem when he was carried off into captivity to see the conquering army approach, destroying the cities near, his, uh, near the capital until finally Jerusalem was besieged and there was no way out and he is captured and taken off. But he also recently saw this in the fall of Babylon. Right, we, we studied this last week in Daniel chapter 5 where the foolish Belshazzar, even as his kingdom is crumbling around him as people are infiltrating Babylon to kill him, he is throwing a party and Daniel witnesses the fall. Even translating for Belshazzar God's message and, uh, of, of judgment. So Daniel has seen this happen, the fall of whatever kingdom or nation he's in, and with it, the uncertainty of what's going to happen. True persecution, as we look at it, as we see in Afghanistan and, and you know, in the even in some of the messages we hear from churches and missionaries there, true persecution seldom results in outrage and protest. Because when true persecution comes, we are too busy running for our lives, fearing for our lives, and worrying about our future and looking to escape. When true persecution hits, right, there's usually not a lot of room for political demonstrations and whatnot. And so what I want to share today as we look at Daniel chapter 6 is really how do we as Christians, first of all, identify when true persecution is happening? How do we prepare and how can we respond in a godly way? So today, as we look at Daniel chapter 6, we will be examining three marks of true persecution to help us be prepared. Of course, we are looking at this from the life of Daniel. And actually, when we start in Daniel chapter 6, life is actually pretty good for Daniel. He didn't have too much to worry about, it seems, even though he was essentially the second highest ranked official in Babylon. As Babylon fell, as Belshazzar was assassinated, God preserved Daniel, uh, perhaps because of his reputation for being an honest and capable leader. Perhaps it was his reputation for being someone who was blessed by God in the interpretation of dreams. But for whatever reason, at the start of Daniel chapter 6, the newly uh, arrived king, the conqueror Darius, he set over the kingdom, we see in verse 1, 120 satraps, or minor rulers, to be throughout the whole kingdom. They're, you can think of them as local governors. Over them, over these 120 satraps, he set three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. An amazing turn of events that this captive enemy uh, you know, official was placed over the Persian uh, governors. And this also sets up why he was targeted. As we see, the first point here is that true persecution seeks godly targets. Look, let's look at why was it that Daniel was singled out 
for persecution. And we see this in uh, verses, uh, verse 4. Uh, then the high officials and satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Now, I find this a fascinating passage because what it shows us is that, first of all, Daniel, the reason Daniel stood out as a target, the reason he annoyed these officials was, first of all, because he had God-honoring integrity. Daniel annoyed with his God-honoring integrity. See, out of all the people Darius could choose to run his kingdom, he picked a most unlikely one, a Jewish captive. Daniel was a slave of the Babylonians, and he was the, the slave of a defeated enemy. But there was something in Daniel that caused Darius, even in the short time that he's been king, to set him over his own countrymen, his own officials, to be one of three high officials over the kingdom. Now, that would automatically put a target on anyone's back. But in addition to that, as we see in verse 3, that Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So he was even destined for greater things, and that probably sealed the deal. The, the other officials were like, well, if we don't do something about this Daniel, he's going to rule over all of us. He's going to be second only to the king. We have to do something. So there's a target on him, but it's interesting that out of all the ways that we can think of politically to get rid of someone like Daniel, they had to turn to target his faith. There was nothing else these officials could do but say, okay, the only way we can get this guy is we got to trip him up in regards to his faith, the laws of his God. Because throughout the book of Daniel, we've seen references that whenever people interact with him, they see that there's something different about him. There is uh, various people have said, the spirit of the holy gods is in him. This is a praise coming from a pagan ruler that, that, hey, Daniel, you know, I don't believe in your God, but there is something special about you. So I would say the spirit of the holy gods are in you. We see that said about Daniel several times. And several times we also see that Daniel's referred to as having an excellent spirit. They recognized that in supernatural gifting, he was special. They recognized that also in his personal conduct, there was something that set Daniel apart. He did his job perfectly without fault. There was no dirt to be able to be dug up about Daniel. There was no way that he could be corrupted with bribes or threatened. He was faithful, he was trustworthy, and he was uh, destined for even greater responsibility. And again, remember, Darius has not been in power for that long. He had just conquered this land. In fact, it's probably been about a year, maybe, since, uh, since you know, they took over. And even in this time, as we will see in the rest of chapter 6, you can tell that Darius not just valued Daniel highly as a subordinate, you can say he cared for Daniel. If you look at the way he reacts um, as Daniel is... Uh, is, is threatened and, and put into the lion's den, Darius cares for Daniel. That's an amazing thing to happen, and it only happened because of Daniel's God-honoring integrity. He was hated because of his godly character, not because he was aggressive, not because he was a political schemer, not because he kissed up to the king. They hated him because he did everything well and there was nothing to complain about. And wouldn't that be wonderful if that was why we were hated? You know, if I had to pick for any reason to be hated or targeted by someone, I would want it to be that. Right? Titus 2, 7 through 8 
puts it this way, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. That almost sounds like an impossibility in our day and age where, you know, any sort of political figure or leader, as soon as they, they rise up, you know, all this dirt comes out. You know, whether real or not, we, we may not know, but all this dirt comes out. It's not too hard to dig up dirt on people in our day and age. But if we walk with God, if we maintain integrity before the Lord, right, that could be true of us. What are we being targeted for? What are we kind of hated for? Are we being hated and targeted for the right thing, for our integrity? Secondly, as we're talking about why Daniel was such a big target, Daniel was attacked for his God-fearing obedience, for his God-fearing obedience. Where could they find grounds to attack him? It was only in his obedience to the Lord. Then these men said, we shall not find any grounds for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Right? Nothing in his conduct or character, there's nothing to spin or to lie about. Think about how amazing this is, how transparently Daniel must have lived for this to be true. We can see from his conduct later that he really hid nothing about himself, uh, open doors, open windows into his life. He lived a transparent life of obedience to the Lord, and that was the only thing they can attack him on. Right, this is similar to the words of 1 Peter 4. Uh, but rejoice, in verse 13, insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. The question is, are we suffering when we do suffer? Are we suffering because we are Christians and we represent Christ well, or are we suffering simply because we're jerks? Right? Sometimes, you know, we may, we may try to think, oh, well, people are just targeting me, or they don't like me because of my faith. And, uh, you know, if you talk to a lot of non-believers, they'll say, you know, the reason I don't like Christians is because they see hypocrisy. They see that we don't live according to what we say. And unfortunately, if we look at the modern sort of discourse, what we see out there in terms of coming from Christians and conservatives, uh, it really doesn't help that reputation. I don't know what's changed. Again, you know, I've been, as, as I'm talking with other pastors and believers, sometimes I'm left scratching my head, thinking, well, what has changed? It seems like when I see people engage each other who, who believe different things, you know, conservatives engaging uh, liberals, Christians engaging non-Christians, there is such an, an air of arrogance and hostility. I don't know whether it's due to the internet age where you kind of have to make your argument and it's got to destroy everybody. You know, you see terms like, oh, wow, watch this liberal get destroyed or watch this uh, atheist, uh, you know, be demolished by this, you know, wonderful debater. We tend to think and, and communicate in terms of debating and winning arguments where it's all about humiliating the enemy. Now, I'm not saying that's true for everyone, but generally speaking, it seems that's the nature of discourse when it's between Christians or conservatives and the other side. There's this idea that we need to stand up and protest and, you know, guard our rights, and we see none of this in Daniel. The, are we suffering because we are a Christian and we represent Christ well and accurately, or are we suffering simply because we're aggressive? That's the question. So we see here that true persecution seeks godly targets. Daniel was targeted because of his faith. The second point, second mark, is this true persecution is countered 
by a godly response. How Daniel responds to the persecution is, uh, is nothing short of amazing. We see, first of all, that Daniel deferred to God's sovereign protection. What was Daniel's response when he first heard what was happening, that these officials, with their schemes, presented a very appealing uh, uh, offer to the king, that, hey, King Darius, you're, you're kind of new in this position. We need to make sure that people are loyal to you and to the new administration. So, for 30 days... Let's make this law. For 30 days, no one can pray to anyone or make a petition to any god except for you. Right? Let's start things off right. Let's make sure people know you're in charge. And Darius happily signed it. When Daniel found out, verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, right, for 30 days, can't pray to anyone except Darius. What did he do? He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, shows or videos about dumb criminals, right? I kind of like to watch those because it makes me feel like you know, there's hope for the world that uh, there are dumb criminals, you know, criminals who, you know, as they rob a bank, they run out of a building. It's a push door, but they pull, right? And then they get caught that way. Or criminals who are, are so foolish, they put down their guns and the clerk grabs it and captures them. Right? But if we were to count, you know, dumb things that criminals do, Daniel was pretty bad, right? If he wanted to break the law, he did it very badly. Right? You can't pray. What does he do? He prays three times a day, open windows, does not change his routine at all, does not go into hiding. And people may think, well, was Daniel being foolish? Was he being rash? Right? He didn't have to do it this way, did he? Like, even if he wanted to, to pray, couldn't he just have closed the windows? Right? Think of everything he could have done. Remember, Daniel was in a position of power. Everything he could have done to fight this. He could have taken a, a protest before the king. He could have responded in anger. He could have flexed his own authority because he was one of the highest officials in the land. Right? Surely he could have done something. Even if he was going down, he could have punished some of those who were scheming against him. What did he do? He didn't, as far as Scripture tells us, he didn't make a peep. He kept doing what he was doing as if nothing had happened. He just faithfully served his God and also his king, the pagan king who, in a sense, sentenced him to this position. He left his protection entirely in the hands of God. Now, I'm not saying that for believers, right? Uh, you know, throughout history, we've seen believers who have taken action to protect others and to protect themselves during times of persecution. I am not saying that is wrong or that we all need to be like this, but what I am saying is if we look at the heart of Daniel, right? I, I actually believe there's a reason he did what he did, which we'll get to, but if you look at the heart of Daniel, he wasn't f afraid for, for his life. He wasn't thinking about his own protection. He left his protection uh, to God. In many ways, this reminds me of what was said about Christ in Isaiah 53, 7, the prophecy about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Instead, what we see Christ do on the night he was betrayed and what we see Daniel do when faced with this persecution they prayed before God openly, and they obeyed God, and they continued to live their lives faithfully. Daniel deferred to God's sovereign protection. But I mentioned, I, I believe there was a reason why Daniel specifically did what he did, and that is because Daniel was preoccupied with God's sovereign plan. 
You see, the schemers had their plan, and the, the king had his plans, but one of the themes that you see in this chapter is that Darius, the new conqueror, the de facto ruler of this empire, the, the, the one who should be the all-powerful king, he was really powerless. That's the one thing you will see. Uh, the schemers were able to manipulate him easily. They appealed to his vanity, his desire to protect his position, and he signed that law without thinking too much about it. And we also see later, as he realized what's happened to him when the schemers came back and said, aha, king, we just signed this law. Do you know who's been praying? Daniel. And we caught him red-handed, right? Shouldn't he suffer the consequence of being thrown to the lion's den, as we have just stated? As he understood what had happened to him, he deeply regretted his position. In fact, we will see that he spent the entire day trying to figure out a way to save Daniel, but he couldn't do it. Right? Uh, the, the laws of the Medes and Persians, the way they set up their government, the law was overall even the king. So even though the king was capable of writing laws and making laws and signing laws into effect, he cannot undo them. There was a limit to his power, and it's a big reminder that even this king was powerless. And we even see a similar situation in the book of Esther with a decree that was signed uh, to target the Jews that at the end of it, the king could not undo it. He could only write another law so that the Jewish people can defend themselves. So we see very clearly the king was powerless, and yet Daniel was not afraid because Daniel was following the plans of God. So the question is, why was it so important for Daniel to pray now? If you look at the text of the law that was signed, you would think, well, if you wanted to target someone, surely you would make something a little longer lasting. Why just 30 days? Right? Couldn't he just stop praying for 30 days and you know, come right back to it? You know, uh, this is, you know, I'm, we may be speculating a little bit, but I think there is good evidence that uh, this is part of a bigger um, spiritual battle that was going on. It's very fascinating. If you look in Daniel chapter 9, right, this is not a chapter we will get to, but in Daniel chapter 9, in verse 1, it says very clearly, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent, a Mede who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, Babylonians. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. What Daniel was saying was, in the year that Darius came into power, right, around this time of chapter 6, Daniel, doing his Bible study, reading the prophecy of Jeremiah, realized, oh, the, the promised um, end of this punishment on Israel is about to, to, to happen. The 70 years of exile is about to end. And what he says in verse 3, he says, Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession. While I was speaking, uh, if you jump down to verse 20 of chapter 9, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, I think that's right there, yeah, uh, confessing the sin of my people Israel and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was seek, speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight. So what Daniel was saying is, in this crucial time, right, when he realized the, the end of the exile is, is happening, people can go back to, to Israel, he devoted himself to prayer. And it was in this crucial time that he actually received the visions for chapter 9, and I believe chapter 8, some of the chapters in Daniel, he actually received visions from God, from the angel Gabriel, during this time when he was seeking the Lord in prayer. Now again, right, it doesn't exactly, you know, 100% connect chapter 6 with chapter 9, but I believe there's enough evidence here to, for us to see that this was a crucial time 
for Daniel to be in prayer. And in fact, he was praying in obedience to other prophecies that were spoken in, for example, 1 Kings 8, where specifically it said that during a time where if the people were ever carried off into slavery, if they repent and they pray towards Jerusalem. Now, this is very specific for the Jews. I don't believe as Christians we need to pray towards a particular place, but specifically for the Jews, pray toward their land which you gave their fathers, the city which you have chosen, that they will have favor with their captors. Right? In, in a gist, that's what 1 Kings 8. So Daniel, knowing Scripture, he responded in a biblical way for what he knew was about to happen. I believe that's why it was so crucial for Daniel to pray. And you understand why it was towards Jerusalem. So Daniel knew something and, and that was going on much bigger, much higher than the political intrigue of his time. And that can also tell us why Satan chose to attack him during this time. See, Daniel understood that no matter what government we may be under, what ruler, how good or bad they may be, uh, the words of Ephesians 6.12 is true for Daniel as it is true for us. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, the idea here isn't that we need to be beware of, like, demons and spirits, stuff like that, but it's really we need to be aware that the plans of God operate in the spiritual realm, that the true battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against the people who persecute us. The true battle is, be, is against the ideas, the, the spiritual influences of those who are, are under the influence of, of Satan. Satan is the one who opposes God's plans. Not the Democrats, not even the Taliban. Satan ultimately is the one who is opposing God's plans and God's people. Daniel's true enemy was not the officials or the king or the lions. Daniel's true enemy was the one who was trying to prevent him from praying and prevent him from following his God. So true persecution is countered by a godly response that focuses on the spiritual and not on the political or the temporal. And finally, the third mark, true persecution fulfills godly purposes. True persecution fulfills godly purposes. So Daniel, without protest without even really a trial, is thrown into the lion's den, and the king is beside himself. And after a sleepless night, the king comes in verse 19. At the break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, the servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? That's a big question on everyone's mind. Now, for those of us who, who came out through Sunday school, we know the answer to the king's question. Daniel is fine. But the question is, why did God allow this to happen? What purpose did he have in mind? I believe there's two main purposes for God's deliverance and for God to handle things in this way. The first is this. The purpose of persecution results in God humbling his opponents. God humbling his opponents. We see as the narrative continues in verse 16, the king commanded and Daniel was brought and cast into a den of lions the king declared to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you, right? And this was, we see the exact same phrase the king asked Daniel at the end of that. But look at what happened to the king in verse 17. And a stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords so that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. So he was forced 
to use his might and authority to condemn someone he loved to death. And then verse 18, Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. It's interesting, again, that this is the picture we get of the great ruler Darius. He was really powerless. He was humbled. He was manipulated. He regretted, and he couldn't undo what he, what he did. And in fact, if you think about it, he probably spent a less peaceful night than Daniel that night. Right, Daniel, I, I believe, you know, obviously he would be in prayer, but Daniel's been in situations like this before, and I believe as soon as he knew he was delivered, there was no reason for Daniel not to have a good night's sleep. So I would say the king probably had a less peaceful night than Daniel. And it's interesting to think about what was the king do doing in that night. It said that he was fasting, that he, he for, for, uh, for, forwent any diversions, any entertainment. And if you look at what he, the words that he spoke to Daniel, perhaps he even spent that night praying to the God of Daniel. Now, I believe that from what we've seen that Darius probably didn't become a believer, a convert to Judaism. But at the very least, out of all the gods he would pray to, that he may still even believe in, he appealed to Daniel's God. And in fact, if you think about it, he probably appealed to Daniel's God against his own gods, who were the basis of his authority to cast Daniel to the lions. So we see that God humbled this king, just as he humbled Nebuchadnezzar before him. But God also answered the schemers, the ones who brought this false charge against Daniel. Verse 24, And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. A gruesome end, a gruesome fate and even as a, as a kid, as I was learning about the story, I often wonder, you know, if it was so easy for the king to do this, why didn't he do this before, <laughs> right? Why did he have to wait till Daniel was safe for, for him to act, right? And it's actually very fascinating because we find the schemers made a mistake when they presented their schemes. They lied to the king. If you look back at verse 7, what they said when they presented this scheme, they said, oh yeah, this law... Verse 7, all the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance. What they told Darius was that, hey, everybody agrees. All your leaders agree. But they didn't mention that Daniel probably wasn't consulted on this. Right? Daniel, one of the three, was definitely not represented. So they were caught in their lie. And now, with Daniel's survival... Right, they were brought and they faced the full justice of the Persian system. So they had the fate they intended for Daniel brought upon uh, themselves. But what is the lesson here? The lesson here is that it is God who will humble his opponents, not us. Right, Romans 12, 19 reminds us that Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. God is the one who will ultimately punish every sin and every sinner, those who have not come to Christ as their Savior. If not in this life, we, we know that justice can certainly happen in some form in this life, but ultimately in the next it will occur. No one can escape God's judgment and God cannot be manipulated or bought. Whether it's kings or, or slaves or everyone in between, we will face the judgment of God. So that brings us to the next point. Why does persecution happen? It is also for God to reveal his grace and glory. There is always the, the, the threat and the promise of God's judgment, but God, even in the midst of, of suffering reveals his grace and glory. Look at the words of Daniel as he answered his king. This verse 22, My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. 
Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. I find it fascinating that even here in the Old Testament, we see a hint of God's saving grace. Notice that it says in verse 22 that he was found blameless before him. And that's an interesting concept because we, re- we understand that what Daniel was doing in his prayer, he was making confession. He says it in, in chapter 9. He was making confession for himself and for his nation. Right? So before the eyes of God, Daniel understood he was still a sinner. So how can he say that he was blameless before God? If you look at the end of verse 23, it says, because he had trusted in his God. So even here in the Old Testament, we see that the righteousness of God was given to sinners because of faith. Right? Just as Abraham before him, Daniel's righteousness, yes, he was a great guy. He was almost perfect in everything he did, yet he made confession, but he was still blameless before God because of his faith. So in the midst of persecution, right, the gospel is still there both for those who are suffering and also, I would say, even more importantly, for those who potentially are doing the persecuting. If we continue on there, in, uh, if we see in verse 25, this is the result, Darius's final proclamation to his people. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you, I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, before, before he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works, great, he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. See, just like Nebuchadnezzar before him, and it's very similar how he starts, Darius makes a similar proclamation, peace be to you, and he turns all the glory, all the attention to the God of Daniel. God is the one who gets the victory and the glory over Darius, over the Persian gods, over the schemes of the officials. See, the goal of persecution, as we are undergoing it, as we see other under others undergoing, understand that the proper end and the purpose of persecution isn't our physical deliverance necessarily, as much as we do pray for that. The goal of persecution is for God's glory to be made known, for his gospel to be spread. And God can accomplish this both in our miraculous deliverance or even in our deaths, as we've heard from many stories of of those who are martyred for their faith. So even though Daniel here got a miraculous result, that is not the the end goal or the promise of persecution. The, The promise of persecution is that God has won. He will be victorious. We do not have to fear anything in this life because our futures are secure in him. And really, the end goal of all of this is echoing the words of Philippians 2, 9 through 11. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. See, the Bible gives us the end of the story. The end of the story is that all will kneel before Jesus as king, whether willingly or grudgingly, whether joyfully or fearfully. For us living through this earthly realm, this earthly time, whatever situation we may be put in, our goal is we want as many of those as possible who will be kneeling before Jesus to do so as his victorious children, not as his defeated captives facing judgment. And we see this in the life of Daniel. As we come to a close in sort of the narrative portion, you know, I struggled greatly with how to close 
this, uh, this sermon, um, mainly because of, you know, as I was preparing, I was just reading and seeing images of what was happening in Afghanistan, and especially hearing about some of the stories coming from pastors and missionaries uh, who were saying things like, you know, we expect in the next few weeks that we will see Jesus face to face. And I'm just struck by the reality that they are facing as we study a passage about persecution. So there's no big conclusion, but I actually wanted to end our time in Daniel praying for those in Afghanistan. If you have your, um, your not bulletin, your <laughs> sermon outlines, you see uh, that instead of having discussion questions, which we normally do, I gave a list of ways you can pray for Afghanistan. And I want to close our time praying for our brothers and sisters, especially uh, fellow believers, and for the church in Afghanistan who are facing the reality of persecution that may, may take their lives. So would you join me as, as we lift up uh, the, the country of Af Afghanistan and also the, the believers there in prayer? Father God, we know that you are a God who delivers. You are a God who performs miracles, who saves lives, who snatched uh, Daniel out of the mouths of the lions and who protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. But Lord, we also know that Lord, there are believers who have went to uh, their eternal reward through gruesome ways, Lord. There are those who loved you who have been put to death, who have been tortured. And Lord, we know that ultimately this is all for your glory, and we know that ultimately all who know you are saved and have an eternal home and eternal joy with you. But we know that in the meantime, as we are living through these times, well, we do not know what will happen. Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. Lord, we lift up the pastors, the church leaders, Lord, those who are caring for a flock in a time such as this, we pray that you will strengthen them. We pray that their eyes will be on heaven. We pray that they will respond with integrity and faith. Lord, we do pray for your protection. We pray for protection upon your church there. We pray for protection especially for the young women and the girls who may be targeted especially. But Lord, we pray most of all that throughout this conflict, whatever may happen, Lord, that your name will be glorified, that Christ will be made known, that even those in the Taliban may come to know Christ. Even as we pray for their conversion, we still pray for your restriction of their activities, and we pray that they will face justice. But Lord, we pray that even throughout it all, that the name of Christ will be exalted. We pray for those of us here in America, Lord, uh, especially for those of us who have contacts with refugees, Lord, with uh, Afghan believers, Lord, that you can use believers here in the church in America, Lord, uh, to be a means of comfort, of support, Lord, and most of all, as a... a a people who are praying. Lord, may we follow the example of Daniel that when persecution happens, the first thing we do is we pray. And we pray consistently and we pray openly to you. Lord, we pray for, Lord, your hand just to be with uh, our, our leaders and our uh, government, Lord, that there can be more effective evacuations. And uh, Lord, we do pray for political and military action, Lord, that uh, there can be a minimal loss of life and liberty. Lord, we do not know what the next few weeks or months may hold, but Lord, we know that you do. You, you know what will happen, and we place our hope and our faith in you, Lord, to enact your plan according to your will. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Pastor Tim. It is um, comforting to know that in the midst of uh, trials and persecutions in this world, that we still uh, worship a God who is above it, um, it all and who has the power to rescue and, and who is faithful to us and that we can trust and rest in that faithfulness and then in that goodness. We serve a God who loves us and who desires uh, to bring good things into our lives. Let's close with a couple songs. Of the goodness of God.
let's stand as we are close in this one last song. Great thanks. have a seat. I have a few quick announcements before we have our benediction. Uh, the first is a reminder that throughout the month of August, so we have a few more weeks, that uh, we will be taking a love offering for Pastor Joseph. So if you would like to uh, contribute to that, just make sure you mark it down in your, if you're um, giving your offering here 
or make sure you select the right um, thing <laughs> when you give online, uh, just to make a note that uh, for Pastor Joseph's love offering. Also, next week, very exciting, we will be having our first in-person IBF, in-between fellowship, after service, and we will have a special speaker, Brad Dacus, from the Pacific Justice Institute, who will be coming to share with us. In preparation for that, um, we know that parking is one of the biggest issues here at our church, so we encourage you, if you plan on attending the IBF, please, as much as possible, park outside of the lot. That way you don't have to move your car when the Cantonese comes in. And also remember that for those who get here early, the first five spots, we have five spots available in the lot across the street. So just look out for the uh, little uh, certificate you can get to put in your car. Um, so you're the first five people here. Uh, we will be serving some light refreshments and the IBF will be from 10.30 to 11.15. So as soon as we're done here, we'll try to head over into the uh, fellowship hall. This, the next announcement is uh, very exciting personally for myself. We will be resuming youth worship in the second Sunday of each month starting next month, which will be September 12th. So we will be resuming youth worship. So uh, the way that will look is uh, everybody will still be combined for the time of singing, and then we will split off for our message time. Now, the structure of youth worship will be a little bit different in that we really want to use that time to allow our young people to, to learn to serve. Um, so we are heading towards a, a completely separate youth Sunday, the every second Sunday of the month, where it will be completely youth run with uh, the youth worship team, ushering, and et cetera. And uh, instead of um, kind of going along with the same sermon series as the adults, uh, we will actually be having messages that are uh, geared towards uh, topics and issues that our young people are dealing with more. And so both the adults and the youth on the second Sunday will kind of be going through a different series than what we are going through the rest of the week together. Um, the last uh, announcement is that uh, Pastor Patrick, uh, his ordination service will be on uh, September 18th from 2.30 to 4 p.m. So that's a very exciting celebration for him. So we want to make sure that uh, if you want to attend, that's the time and the date. Oh, I did forget one that was added uh, sort of last. There will be a GCM, a general congregational meeting, on September 5th at uh, 12 30 p.m. It will be held in person at church, but it will also be live streamed. So please be on the lookout for that. So with that, uh, I invite you to stand as we have our benediction. Our benediction today comes from Romans 12, uh, chapters, uh, chapter 12, verses 14, uh, 15, 16, and 21. May you bless those who persecute you. May you bless and do not curse them. May you Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. May you live in harmony with one another, not being haughty and associating with the lowly. May we not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, God bless you. Have a great week. You conquer the grave You free every captive And break every chain, oh God You have done great